Hello, Nana Mafo. Hello. <laughs> I said it right this time. Um, how have you been? I've been good. Busy? <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot going on with you. There's You've been very on. vocal on social media. Oh, yes. <laughs> but before we get into that, I just want to say you are an inspiration to your peers, the African, com not even just African, I would say the community and also proud Ghanaian. Fair description? Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nana, obviously, I know your condition, but looking at you, you wouldn't be able to tell to you actually speak to someone about your condition, which is the tracheostomy. Tracheostomy, that's correct. Yeah, I said it correctly. Tracheostomy. First, first try. <laughs> <laughs> so, would you like to talk us through it? Um, a tracheostomy is inserted in a baby, an adult, a child, when they have difficulty breathing. So it's an insertion in the neck area. And it's an artificial tube, which is fitted in the neck to enable a person to breathe. So when did that, when was that inserted? Like, was it when you were born? From birth. From birth. Yeah, I was born with a rare limitation of breathing. Was that premature? Was it premature. Pre How many months? Three months premature, but six months early. Oh, wow. So you were born six months, yeah. a six months yeah. period, yeah. yeah. And so you said that can be incident in an adult or kids as well? Yep. So or, when or, or if your organs shut down and you can't breathe by yourself, that's a way to... So you still breathe. have that now? Yes. So how do you cope with it every day? I grew up with it, yeah. so it's it's natural. You know, waking up in the morning, sterilise, clean the wound, um, making sure that the tube doesn't have any mucus, which in layman term is snot, which comes out of your nose, but for me it will come out of my tube. So I have to clean it, sterilise it, and make sure everything's okay. So you take the tube out? out take the of whole it. tube out, oh. clean it, have the saline water, the medical equipment, clean it out, lukewarm water, salt water, just to make sure all the bacteria dies, and pop it back in. Because earlier you did mention that it helps you to breathe. So yeah. you taking it out, <coughs> does that mean you have a spare one that you put it on quickly to avoid you to... No, 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 no. I can have it out for a little time period. The hole won't close. But if I leave it out for an hour, as you know, skin tries to heal. Yeah. So the hole will try and merge. So the hole, sorry, describe it to me. Is it just here or? I can show you. Oh, okay. <coughs> oh, so the tube goes through there. The tube goes through there. Yeah. And then pop it on. So when you take it out, do you go through any pain or? Yes, slightly, because it's touching the inner, inner, you know, areas or parameters of my voice box. So taking it out, slight scratch, and I'm putting it in, there's a slight scratch. Okay, I understand now. Yeah. So let's go back to the time that your mum gave birth to you. I want mm -hmm. to talk to, through it by stage, stages by stages. Yep. Um, obviously, in the African community, there is stigma. Yep. You were born here, right? Born in this country, yeah. Yeah. Did you go to Ghana before? Went to Ghana when I was 10. You went to Ghana at 10, and how long did you live there for? Till I was 14. 14. Yeah. So how was the reaction when you went to Ghana, like, in terms of family? Um, when I went back to Ghana, they removed the tube. I didn't have the tube. Who removed the tube? The hospital. In Ghana? O over here. Over here. Why is they, that? They, they thought because I hadn't grown, there was time for my airway to get strong. So if they removed it, it could naturally heal itself or widen. So within that time period, they were observing to see how it worked. Even though you were going back to Ghana? Even though I was going back to Ghana, yeah. Weren't they a bit um, concerned living they this were, country at but that young age? They were, but the, the promise that my parents made was that I would come back every year to have checkups. Why did your mom choose to take you then? Not my mom, my dad. Your dad? So. Wanted me to learn the culture. Wanted me to understand that 
Britain isn't the beginning and the end of life. There's struggles in the world. There's people that can't go to school. So when I'm getting up in the morning thinking, yeah, fresh pint of milk, I want cornflakes. There's people out there who don't have that. So it was to humble me and just to make sure I didn't get into any type of altercation growing up as a young black boy in the 90s. Because I'm not saying we don't have the equipment in Ghana, yeah. but at your age, every parent will be a bit concerned when it comes to taking their kids back home, yeah. especially when they have that condition. Yeah. Yes. There was concerns, Yeah. but they wanted to take that risk. Because mm. if anything happened, I would just be flown back. That's a big risk. That's a big it? risk, yeah. With family members, let's, when you went to Ghana, how was it like? Were you able to fit in? Was it a cultural shock, especially having that condition as well? It was a cultural shock. Yeah. Um, in the city, it wasn't so bad. When I went to the village, that's when I noticed, okay, people were staring at me. Snide comments were being made because they assumed I was born here. I didn't understand tree. So they were saying a lot of stuff in tree which I understood. Mm. Such as? Oh, uh, Akwawi, this guy, he looks like a, a snake. That's what they told us when he was born. But he doesn't look like that. What's going on? Is he strong enough to be here? What are, the, what are his parents thinking of? You know, just little comments. And eventually I asked my dad, you know, why were they so concerned? And apparently rumors went around that when I was born, I was so tiny like a snake. I wasn't going to exist or live, you know, a significant life that they deemed appropriate. And to see me at the age of 10, it shocked them. But to me, when I look at you, you look normal to me. So I'm, I'm sure at the age of 10, you still look normal like any other 10 year old. I looked at any, any other 10 year old. Yes. Yeah. So those were the, um, the kind of challenges you faced in Ghana. Challenges and people telling me I couldn't do things. I would play football, I'd be told, oh, you're a sickler, you can't play, relax. Or I wanted to try and fetch water. Oh, your upper body isn't good, relax. So it was human barriers by people telling me you can't, you can't stop. You're not strong enough. Why are you doing it? And what annoyed me the most as a child was people making assumptions what I could and couldn't do, you know? So it wasn't a pleasant experience at yeah. that age. Uh, I got into arguments a lot, you know, I lost a few friends because their mindset wasn't open. Mm. Um, and especially from my own family, I had similar connotations of this guy can't do anything. You know, why are you telling him to do stuff? He's a sickler after all. And that's how I had to live my life. And how did your parents deal with it? You, did you go with your mom and dad? Or just I went with dad? my mom and dad, but yeah. I lived with my dad. Yeah. My mother fought against those ideologies that I wouldn't amount to nothing. She also made people aware that there was nothing wrong with me mentally. Mentally, I was capable. Um, however, when it came to my father, I would say disability awareness wasn't his strong point. So yes, he established, yes, there was something different about me. I had to breathe differently. But in terms of educating his family or other people, he did it, but I don't think he did it to the effect that educated others that, oh, this guy, he's actually an achiever. He can do stuff. Don't pity him. Rather, it came across like I got people pitying me. It's ridiculous. 
and you would be surprised that still going on uh, yeah. it might not be that obvious but obviously people do chat a lot yes. in uh, here it's accepted more than ghana even in ghana they could say your baby excuse me to say some people use witchcraft and yeah. stuff like that which is very degrading the stigma is still going on yeah you are in your 30s now and you've dealt with quite a lot and you're doing what you're trying to put you've put your voice out there yep. and you've also you don't see it as disability you call it unique unique ability it's just a different path of living yeah so so that's what you mean by unique ability yep. how can they break this barrier i know it's going to take a while but what do you think can be done firstly for the barrier to be even for the dialogue of conversation to be had people with the barriers need to own their disability, need to own their uniqueness, and need to speak with confidence to educate people who don't know. I'm not saying every person with disability needs to be up in your face, but be open and willing to educate others. It's, it's purely education. Mm -hmm. And here and in Ghana, I feel people with disabilities, their voices are not loud enough. Or if, it's, if it is, it's clamped down. And as you know, people with disabilities, a lot of them don't have confidence. Not, them, not everyone's like me. A lot of them don't have confidence. So they regurgitate into themselves and they're just lost in society. Yeah. So, for a conversation to be had, it needs to start with the individual. And workshops need to be put in place. You know, in villages, people with disabilities need to come out, need to walk in the village. Don't be shy or ashamed. If someone calls you, you know, a witch, you need to ask them what part of a witch do they mean? You know, what makes you a witch? You have a disability, you're still living, you're still breathing. You just need them to understand you're living a life like a tom tom. It's mm -hmm. a redirection. Yeah. But you're living your truth. Nana has spoken passionately about his disability. He has used social media to inform and educate people about the challenges and opportunities for people with disability. His tenacity to be heard was rewarded as he was nominated for the 2018 National Diversity Awards. So it all stemmed from a personal experience that I had in employment where I didn't feel my voice was being heard uh, as an employee and as a disabled person. So I decided to start doing Facebook Live videos, talking about employment rights, talking about discrimination against people, with disability um, and talking about my own personal journey as a person with a disability, what I'd been through. Little did I know that people beyond or people within the media spectrum were watching. So I got nominated for an award, uh, the National Diversity Award. And at first I thought it was a joke because I got an email, I've been nominated for an award you know, um, and would like to see you and recognize your achievements. So I didn't take it serious. Then I saw pictures of myself in a magazine, in a newspaper. The BBC reached out to me. It was mind blowing. You know, it was one of those things I was thinking, wow. So from doing a Facebook Live, I'm on an international platform of the BBC. I'm being called by different radio stations to talk about a fundamental problem which nobody wants to approach with boldness. I'm not saying it's not being approached, it is. But people with actual disabilities are not vocalized as I am. So whilst their attention is on me, I will make sure everybody is aware that I've got a disability, but I'm not um, a weak person. I'm not vulnerable. I'm here to open people's minds and make people aware that disability is not a disease. 
So through my whole experience, that was my message. We went to the occasion. It was a great experience. I met other great people from the LGBT community, from the race community, um, from disability, my category. It was a wonderful experience. I saw a picture um, of you and Warwick Davis, who's also well known here. Legend, <laughs> legend. Very honorable gentleman. A piece of advice he gave me was to not allow people to determine my fate. Always speak and make sure you're heard. Don't allow people to lighten your, your, your light. And since then, I speak my truth. It may not be to the taste of everybody, but at least you've heard my truth. And you're aware that just because I have a disability, I'm not gonna allow your thoughts or the global attitude of disability dampen my spirit. And I'm sure you've touched a lot of people out there. Yes. You know, the people are always watching. Yeah. They are always watching. So you are employment support officer. Yes. And you've helped people with disabilities to get a job. Yep. How great is that? To me, it's heartwarming. It's something that really touches me. And I wake up in the morning excited because I'm helping people like myself with various disabilities get into the working sector. With your current job, or I would say previous jobs as well, do you think it was based on merit or was it pure sympathy? Based on merit and based on my pure um, compassion and understanding for people with disability. Disability is one of those things that you either get it or you don't, and I get it. So um, aside from voicing out your opinions on disability, what do you do also in your spare time? Spare time, well, I speak to youth within schools, colleges, um, within my local community. Um, there are some government organisations which want me to do a speech on disability, mm. employment, and mental health. As you know, mental health is a big thing within the black community. Um, I'm going around inspiring people to look within themselves and approach disability from a different angle. That's the impact you want to have with yes. your work. So what can we expect? What's next for you? <laughs> <laughs> what you can expect from me, well, to be a pain in the backside. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you would describe it? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, let, let, let's go back to where I'm from, Ghana. Yeah. When you talk about disability, it's like mm. one of those things don't talk about. It's a waste of time. Yeah. So I want to get to the people that think it's a waste of time, be in their face, and make them rethink life rethink that in the future something could happen you're going to get old you're going to lose your sight you're going to lose your hearing you may get diabetes your leg you may not be able to walk it's all forms of disability yeah. so i just want to be that thorn in people's sight and make them register that disability is upon everybody we're all disabled in different forms we may not know it mm. but we can live lives normal and nobody's to be stigmat or labelled indifferent. Rather, we should be celebrated. Anna, it's been great talking to you. Thank you very much. And I'm me. sure you're going to take it further and further and people will be educated Indeed. on disability. Well, I'm going to stop saying disability is unique abilities. ability. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been great talking to Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hope to see you soon. Thank you.